I'm going to talk about uh, something related to what Tim was going to talk about, which is 3D TV, past, present, and future. So this is an opinion piece uh, rather than presenting recent research. So let's see how much I can upset everybody in the audience. So the past of 3D TV. So people have always wanted to represent the reality. So painting in 2D is, is relatively easy. We've been doing it for tens of thousands of years. But 3D representations, sculpture is the best we could do until we invented photography. And then with the invention of photography, there was this massive want to present a different picture to each eye. And so you go to any museum and you'll find uh, stereoscopes like this with vast collections of photographs. I imagine there are quite a few people in the audience have got one of these at home as well. And indeed, the, the desire to represent stereoscopically was so, so good that uh, John Logie Baird, when he was developing the first TV transmitters, put 3D into the specification for what a TV transmitter must do. And in fact, his first TV transmitter, which is this electromechanical device, was capable of doing both color and 3D. Now, of course, what then got out into the commercial marketplace was neither color nor 3D. It was black and white 2D uh, because we just didn't have the technology to do this. But the desire for 3D was there right at the start. And finally, about five, six years ago, we got 3D TV back into the marketplace. So his vision got there. But it's since sort of died off. There was a massive amount of hype five, six years ago, and now there's no hype anymore. So what's going on and why? So what I'm going to do is look at four case studies of, four brief case studies of things that have happened in the past to see if this casts any light on what's going on with 3D TV. So first of all, let's look at the history of cinema. This is the very first movie ever shot. It's a train arriving in the station. Many of you will have seen this before. And this was an absolute marvel in 1895. Nobody had seen moving pictures before. This was amazing. People flocked to go see this. It's a fantastic gimmick, uh, just utterly wonderful. People were wowed by this. Uh, the audience today is a bit more jaded. This is probably not very exciting to you. And it's interesting to see what this movie lacks. It's got no story. It's got no sound. It's not in color. It's not widescreen. And it's certainly not in 3D. And the gimmick very quickly wore off, and very quickly people realized if you want to keep people coming back to watching your movies, you have to have a story. So by 1903, we had story. By 1906, we'd worked out how to do color, and by 1916, we'd worked out how to do color properly. By 1922, we'd worked out how to do 3D, and there were 3D movies released in 1922. And sound didn't turn up till 1926. It turns out to be more difficult to do sound in the movies than it is to do 3D. And widescreen didn't actually turn up till 53 because that's when TV took off and they needed some gimmick to get people back into the movie theaters. So for a modern movie, you need story. Nobody will go see a movie without a story. And sound seems to be super important to human beings. Color, though, not so much. If you um, have a black and white movie, people will still go see it, and there's a niche market for black and white. Widescreen, you don't need. People are still quite happy to watch four to three aspect ratio things. And 3D, you don't need. People are still happy to go see 2D movies and watch 2D television. So some things seem to be vital, some things not so much. And if you don't believe me, think about Casablanca. This is black and white, four to three aspect ratio. It's not in 3D. But people will still buy a DVD or a Blu-ray of Casablanca because the story is so good and it's a classic movie. So what happens as each of these things was introduced to the movies is that it started off as a gimmick. When sound was introduced, it was a gimmick. It was to get people into the movie theaters to see this. People went to see it because it had sound. When color was introduced, it was completely overdone um, to get people in. And very slowly, the directors of movies learned how to use this as part of the process of telling a story. And eventually, they just became part of the tool set. So if you go to any film school, they'll tell you how to use sound to tell the story, how to use color to emphasize the emotions in the story, and now how to use 3D to emphasize the emotive content of the story you're telling. But with 3D, it took a very, very long time for directors to get this. 
and directors and producers were for a long time just constantly throwing things at the audience, which tended to give the audience a headache. But we finally got there. We now know how to do 3D properly as part of our storytelling tool set. And I think the watershed on this was nine, 2009 with Up and Avatar, where professional stereographers actually had complete stereoscopic storyboards of how you use 3D to emphasize the emotive content of the story you were telling. Because when it comes to down to it, you go see a movie not because it's got a gimmick like 3D or sound or color, but because of believable characters, a great story, and a compelling world in which this is all set. And people who make movies know that these are the three things you need. And then all the other stuff, the music and the sound, and whether it's how well it's lit and how you do the framing and the 3D, are part of the way you tell the story. And we're now there that we can do this with 3D. So the second case study is color TV. So it does the introduction of color television tell us anything about how 3D TV penetration into the market will go? So here what we have is, on the blue line, is the percentage of US households with a monochrome TV. And you see in seven years it went from 10% to 75% of the population, with all the Luddites gradually buying TVs as we went on through the 60s. But with color TV, the first broadcast of color TV in the US was in 54, and it took 18 years until half of US households had a color TV. So you see there's a long sequence of nothing much happening in sales of color TV. And part of that was because there wasn't a lot of content. Why would you buy a color TV if there was no content? So the company started to produce content, so those of you who are old enough will remember The Lone Ranger and The Adventures of Superman as being early color productions. But the thing that really kicked off this curve to start kicking up was that NBC committed to broadcasting everything in primetime television in color. And that's what kicked this curve up. And very quickly, within seven years, your house of households have swapped the black and white TV for a color. Now, is that going to happen with 3D? The problem now is that the entire broadcast market is fragmented. People don't just sit around in a living room watching the one TV in the house. They all watch it on their own devices. And nobody is committing to broadcasting everything in 3D. So what about 3D movies? Does that tell us anything? So the history of 3D movies, and I'm grateful to Andrew Woods for producing this graph for me, is that... Uh, we had a little peak in 22, which used the anaglyph glasses. They very quickly worked out that anaglyph gives you a stinking headache if you watch a movie for any length of time. But by the mid-50s, we had polarized glasses. So it was the golden age of 3D, and then various attempts as we go across to revitalize 3D. And the current peak, this goes to 2010 here, this just keeps going up. So we finally made it. 3D movies now work. But why, in the 50s, didn't it take off? And the answer seems to be this, that in the 50s, to do polarized movies, you needed two projectors, one with the left eye polarization, one with the right eye polarization. And this works fantastically in the movie studios with fresh film that they've produced, with a professional projectionist running the two projectors, and everything worked fine in the movie studios. They saw fantastic 3D movies in the 50s. But the problem with movie film is that it's a mechanical thing, and the film breaks. So if the film breaks, you need to splice it and fix it, but you're running two projectors, so you need to splice and fix both films. So film breaks, and the guy out in the field who has to do it is Steve here, who's just out of high school, he's paid peanuts to run his projection in the movie theater. And Steve's the problem, because Steve is the guy who, when the film breaks, he knows how to fix the film, but he doesn't know enough to go and fix the other one. He also, so you get the films out of sync temporally, which will give you a stinking headache within about a minute. And he's also not too careful to keep the two projectors aligned vertically, which also gives you a stinking headache if he gets that wrong. So Steve is the reason that 3D movies in the 50s gave you a headache. It was nothing to do with bad 3D movies. So why aren't they a problem now? And the problem is now we've got rid of Steve. We've replaced him with the digital projector. And everything's done in the one box. The two movies are perfectly synced temporally, perfectly aligned vertically, and everything is great. You just press a button, and it all works. And 
The latest figures I've got are that there are now 75,000 3D-enabled movie screens in the world, and this from a website that claims there are only 150,000 movie screens in the world total. So the estimate here is about half of movie screens are now 3D-enabled. So 3D movies are here to stay. Now, I did some work in the 90s on autostereoscopic displays. We made these uh, fun things which don't need the glasses. We tried to sell it into the games market, just as the arcade industry was crashing. That was a bad idea. We made something like this. This cost a million dollars in parts alone. That's not going to sell very well, is it? But uh, this is when the money ran out. But what we learned from going and talking to people in the 90s was there were only two markets where people really needed 3D. Visualizing complex 3D structures in scientific and medical visualization, such as this, or dealing with robots. Uh, that's where people would really pay and really found that 3D added an enormous benefit to what they were doing. Uh, and then all the other areas, advertising, putting 3D TVs into shop windows so that the image is projecting through the glass, video arcade games, or going and talking to people in Las Vegas about gambling or putting things into theme parks. 3D might be useful, but actually in all those places it turned out that 3D was being used as a gimmick, which means it's got a bit of a wow for a while, and then people say, that was great, but what's, where's the next wow coming from? So there wasn't really any traction to get it into these markets. It was nice to add the 3D, but it wasn't as nice as adding color to black and white or as adding sound to the movies. So the present, we're in a very interesting position. If you were around five years ago, you'll remember adverts like this for where they were really pushing 3D TV, saying it will give you a fantastic new experience. And really, the television manufacturers were pumping 3D as the next big thing. Please throw away your existing set and buy a new one. And all that sort of stuff has largely vanished. And now what they're trying to do is buy a 4K TV and throw away your existing set. So 3D TV, all the hype's gone, and people haven't really adopted it. So where is this going? And I think for the future, we need two things. We need content, and we need technology. So the problem with content is we don't actually have a lot of it. Um, there's probably about 250 good 3D movies out there, but that's 500 to 1,000 hours worth of movies. And the best I've heard from any broadcaster is that they'll commit to broadcasting a couple of sports events a week in 3D, which gives you about 300 hours of content over a whole year. So if you look over a year, you've got about one month of 3D content to fill out a year of programming. So there's going to be a lot of repeats on the 3D TV channel. And we could do 2D to 3D conversion, but most of the automatic conversion, while it's getting better and better, still glitches occasionally enough that it's not really very compelling and, annoy and it is annoying. And the manual conversion gives you adequate 3D, but it's expensive to do. Plus, if you've done a 2D to 3D conversion, if the original movie was shot without really any thought about the stereoscopy, the, 2D, the 3D conversion is not going to be great. In the same way, if you colorize a black and white movie, it doesn't actually add much to the movie. Whereas if you use color at the start, you actually put it in as part of the storytelling toolkit. And many of you will remember that Clash of the Titans, which was released shortly after Avatar, was, had its 3D production done in post-production, and it was awful. I mean, I'm not saying the movie itself was great, but uh, what happened here is you had this massive monster which looked really awe-inspiring on a 2D screen, but when, you, when they converted it to 3D, it looked like a little model monster coming out of the water. Um, so doing 3D in post while it's possible is not as good as doing 3D from the beginning. So where are we going to get this content from? Well, we can uh, tell good stories, and that's very expensive to do. Uh, we can do sports, but... We need something where the 3D actually adds value. Now, the rugby line-out is somewhere where 3D adds value because uh, you can see much more clearly in 3D whether the guy's going to catch the ball or not. But if you think about the audience in this stadium, most of the audience are over 20 meters away from the action, 
and the stereoscopy is not great. So you actually can really enjoy a good game of football without needing 3D vision. Uh, computer gaming is a great place to do 3D, but that's less than 10% of the population actually get play 3D computer games. And I hate to say this, but what really took off for 2D color television was um, soap operas and game shows. That's what really pushed it. And I'm not sure I can see a market for 3D game shows these days. So there's a problem. Where are we going to get the content from? Is anybody actually going to commit to doing everything in 3D when it costs 20 to 25% more to do it in 3D and to do it in 3D properly? And will the audience see a value? There's, these are big questions. And then there's a the problem of the glasses. We know that anaglyph glasses, while they are cheap, give you a bad effect. If you watch anything for more than five minutes with anaglyph glasses, you will get a headache because of the color rivalry. We know shuttered glasses give you good effects, but they're expensive. We know polarized glasses, such as the ones that we move, use here and we use in the movie theaters, are cheap and good. But the glasses are a problem. And let me explain why. So this is a bunch of work colleagues watching Super Bowl in 2009. You may recognize them. Um, they're all wearing a, a pair of glasses which look very similar to the ones we have, as if they've actually stolen them from us. Um, but they're watching the Super Bowl. It's a special event. They're all sitting down in the theater in the basement of the White House to do this. And that's great for sports events. It's great for going to watch a movie. But many people don't watch normal TV that way. They do this. They do the ironing, they do housework, they are watching, playing on the laptop while watching something on TV. So they're half attending to what's on the TV. They might be having a romantic evening on the couch, and the glasses are a real turn-off if you're trying to have a romantic evening on the couch. So the way consumers consume TV means that the glasses are a problem, because most consumers, most of the time, are not sitting down to exclusively watch the screen. And that's why movies work well, because when you go to the movies, you are there mostly to exclusively watch the screen, modulo the romantic entanglements. So can we do this without the glasses? And we've had two talks this morning about doing this without the glasses. And we all know in this audience that there's lots of different ways of doing 3D without the glasses, uh, the most popular being the lenticular lenslets and the parallax barriers. And you get really nice effects. You can go out and buy. This is a, a new site display. I think it's a parallax barrier um, from about five years ago. You can go out and buy these. But there's a pro, and they work really well for a single user. And we can do nice handheld or laptop auto stereoscopic displays for a single user. But the problem comes when we think about getting this into the home, because most auto stereoscopic displays, all auto stereoscopic displays, have limited viewing zones. And you have to sit in the right place. And yes, you can move forwards or back a bit. And you can move your head a bit left, right. But you've got to be in the right zone to see the autostereoscopic effect. Now, the good thing about lenticular lens X and parallax barriers is they give you multiple zones for free. So you can sit with your friend, both watching the autostereoscopic display and getting a nice 3D effect. But the problem with all the autostereoscopic technologies is they have an optimal viewing distance so what you're saying to consumers, if you put, sell one of these on the market, is you must rearrange your living room so that all the chairs are in a straight line, a fixed distance from the screen, and the chairs are in the correct positions to make sure that each head will be in the right viewing zone. Now, this isn't a new idea. 15 years ago, one of the big Japanese manufacturers actually uh, started producing something like this where you had a very large screen like this one, and then you had seven chairs bolted to the floor with headrests so that the audience could sit and have their heads in the right position. Now, that was great for showing things off, but didn't sell into the home market. And even worse for the home market is you've got to be fairly technically literate to make this work. So when Uncle Harry comes round, he will no doubt stand in the wrong place, see a pseudoscopic image, and you've got to train your consumers that if it looks wrong, you move until it looks right. So where do we go next? Are VR headsets the right thing to do? There's lots of hype around VR at the moment. It's going to take off. 
but this is even worse than wearing the glasses if you want a romantic evening. And so this, I think, too, is going to remain niche. Yes, the gamers will do this, great for visualization, but can you imagine a family sitting around at home, everyone wearing the headset? Maybe you can, but you can't wear the headset and prepare dinner or read your email at the same time. So there are issues there. So I've got six little messages to take home from this. So I think the 3D with the glasses only works for special events. But I think that doing it without the glasses for the home situation is really tricky. If you're going to do it with glasses, they've got to be cheap and robust and replaceable. You don't want to have a $100 set of glasses broken when your teenage son sits on them. The 3D content has to be good. The people have to see that the 3D content is actually going to add value. And that means that automating the 2D to 3 conversion is probably a mistake. And if the 3D content is going to be good, it's got, the 3D has got to be part of the storytelling and not just a gimmick. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you.